How do the New York Jets bounce back on Sunday against the Cleveland Browns? Are they making the right decision going with Joe Flacco over Mike White? Let's talk about it in today's Jake Asman Show. My guest is the founder of, of JetsXFactor.com. The great Robbie Sabo is going to join us. So let's hit it and get it started. My name is Jake Asman. Week two, Jets at the Browns. Can New York rock Cleveland at the Dog Pound? You're writing the story of your own life. Never allow another man to hold a pen. Please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button down below. Super chat, baby. Cut the line. Can these Jets shot the football world? Now, let's talk about the New York Jets. This is the Jake Asman Show. Here we go. It was announced that Joe Flacco will start for the second week in a row for the Jets in Cleveland on Sunday against the Browns. Right move, wrong move. That's the decision that Robert Sala and company have made. How did the Jets bounce back against Cleveland? That's what we're talking about in today's show. So let's bring on today's guest, one of the best, the co-founder of JetsXFactor.com. The man who does a podcast with Wayne Corbett, new episode available today. The great Robbie Sabo joins us now. What's up, Robbie? New intro, huh? And Monday night, uh, Monday night football vibe. I think, right? We got the the big game music, courtesy of our guy Stan, the man who made it possible. That is nice. I'm loving it. And yeah, they're going Flacco. And yeah, I'm curious to see how the fans feel about it. Um, it it's one of those interesting situations where it's. It's all over the place. It's Flacco, fine. Uh, go Mike White. And then you even get the struggler crowd, too. So it's all over the place, and I, I can't blame Jets fans right now. I would have gone with Mike White. That Me being too. said, I felt like all along they were going to go with Flacco for another week. It does sound like, though, as it should, the leash is a lot smaller, a lot shorter than it was, of course, in week one. If they go out there in the first half and they have three points again or they just can't move the ball, how do they stick with Flacco for another full game? This guy does not deserve the benefit of the doubt. He's been a bad quarterback the last couple of years. He hasn't been awful with the Jets necessarily, but, Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe Flacco's 0-10 in his last 10 starts with Denver and the Jets, and he's 3-17 and in his last 20 starts. This guy is not owed anything when we're all just waiting for Zach Wilson to return, hopefully against the Steelers. Yeah, I don't get it, to be honest. And, you know, I hear the thought Flacco White did the same thing. You know, if you're going to make a change, go to Streveler. You, you can't do that. Streveler, for Streveler to start, you have to change the entire offense. It has to be a, a Greg Roman type offense. Because you notice with Streveler, when, you know, he's good, you need he needs air underneath the ball, like Lamar Jackson. And you got to get his legs involved. You got to change the entire offense. And that takes time. That takes a season to do. And you don't want to do that with Zach Wilson coming back. Number one. Number two, Flacco and White are not the same. White, he's got a longer release. He's not Johnny Unitas. He'll never be. But he's also not a statue like Flacco. If you're going to play Flacco, you have to have pristine pass protection. It has to be perfect. Because when you watch the film in that week one game, he was looking at the rush. He, he looked like a young quarterback, looking at the rush, worried to get hurt, to get hit. And when you're starting Flacco, you don't, that's something you don't want to see. You want to see him stand in there with a strong chin and, and be confident when delivering the ball. Uh, so Mike White and Flacco are very different quarterbacks. And, you know, Flacco... You know, when you think, you kind of get the wrong impression sometimes when you think about him as a veteran quarterback, that he's a progression guy, that he goes through all his progressions perfectly, pure pocket passer, and he is a pocket passer, but he's more of a sightline thrower. Like, when, when he was hitting it good during that Super Bowl run, a lot of it was quick stuff. A lot of it was three-stepping st three out, and he bypassed a lot of those opportunities on Sunday, and you can't do that when you can't stretch the field. And the problem the Jets' offense had – they ran the ball great early on, but the problem they had is LaFleur couldn't stretch the field because they couldn't rely on the offensive line to pass protect. So they couldn't do any five to seven step drops uh, consistently. 
you know, working off play action was fine, but can't stare down the rush. And Flacco was jittery, and that's not a good thing. And Mike White, uh, for his under the radar traits, I think he's tough in the pocket. And if I'm the coach, you know, you get few opportunities to see what he could do on the big stage. And I kind of want to see what he could do. I mean, the leash better be short because you can't be Robert Sala and say you're taking receipts and, you know, we're going to turn this thing around and then go out there and for the second game in a row. You, know, you, you score no points. Like the Jets had three points in this game, as far as I'm concerned, on Sunday. They scored a garbage time touchdown late. I, I, I mean, look, their thought process is well, you know, if the line holds up better, Joe can make the plays. And at times he did make some plays. And it's like, man, just, just show us. Just mm-hmm. show us. If you're going to go with Joe Flacco, it better work. Like the Jets need to go out there, Robbie, and find a way to win this game. People are just tired of hearing about how it's going to get better and we're building this, and we're doing this right. It's like, show us, win a game in September and keep the season alive for another week. Think think about last season, LaFleur. He comes out week one against Carolina, tries to establish the run. Same thing as we saw, 13 personnel, three tight ends. Personnel wasn't exactly the same, but the mindset was the same. Try to be physical, try to establish that run. LaFleur, he's kind of an old-school offensive mind where – He wants to establish the run. Everything works off of the run, the play action, and that's fine. But as the season went along last year, he got put in situations where he had to think outside the box. You know, how many throwbacks, how many crazy type plays did you see as the season went along that worked? And, you know, your eyes got wide open like, okay, you know, the man's trying to do things. A lot of jet motion with Berrios. Didn't see that in week one uh, because – Again, it was trying to establish that identity. To his credit, it worked. I mean, the 13 personnel didn't work, but the running game worked. They just didn't get quarterback play, and they didn't protect him either. And the protection looked a lot worse because of the quarterback play and vice versa. So when when you have both of those things not working, you have no chance in this league. Cleveland, Sunday. The Browns obviously have Miles Garrett. That's a major concern for a Jets offensive line that did not play well by all accounts, in week one. I mean, what can we expect from this Jets O-line? I mean, one thing I could point to is I don't think Lakin Tomlinson will continue to play as bad as he did, it appears like he did, in week one. So I'm expecting him to be better, maybe fans better, because he has an, a you know a full week of practice now, knowing that he's going to be uh, the left tackle again for this team. But, you know, immobile quarterback in Flacco, facing a good defensive line with maybe one of the best defensive players in the league in Miles Garrett. I don't think a whole lot of Jet fans are very confident right now in the team's chances on Sunday. Yeah, it is. Um, Corbett made a good point last night. It's probably good that they're on the road this week, even though you'd rather be home. It's probably good they're on the road based on the back pages, Dayball doing his thing with the two-pointer. So I think it takes the pressure off a bit. It's good that they're not playing a stud quarterback defensively. Mm-hmm. And defensively, I have very few concerns. The positives coming out of week one were they stuffed the run. They stuffed it cold against the best rushing team in the league, uh, maybe outside the Bills. And their DBs look tremendous. And their pass rush looks good. But offensively, what can you expect against the Browns? They got to pass protect. And it's Miles Garrett. And they also don't have backs who pass protect well either. Like Tevin Coleman was their best guy, which is why it stunned me that that they cut Tevin Coleman. Because when you want a six guy to stay in the block, Tevin Coleman would be that guy. Um, I'd expect the same thing. They're going to try to establish the run early and see what happens. And it's got to work. It's got to work because they need that play action for Flacco to get into rhythm. And they really could you could use just like a score early, just so it's not like the, oh, God, here we go again. Like score on the opening drive, put points up. On the board. I mean, get go down the field and get seven. Just do something. I know the Browns are a good team, but it's not like they dominated Carolina on mm-hmm. Sunday. And it's September in the NFL. Like, teams are rusty. You don't really know what teams are necessarily just yet. I just I, I can't accept the Jets going out there and playing another non-competitive game. Like this needs to be a game with them having a chance to win, like Sunday should have been, based on how well the defense played. Yeah, and the Browns, I mean, the Browns defense is solid. You know, the Miles Garrett, we know him. They got uh, Denzel Ward. But there there can be opportunities downfield. The thing to watch out early in terms of game plan is LaFleur. He understands you have to stretch the defense. And if you don't, 
it gets crowded and, and there's less room to operate. And they found themselves in that situation against Baltimore, a good D. So there has to be some plan if the defense allows it, and they probably will. Every defense that's going to face the Jets is going to make them beat them over the top. And if they come out that way, LaFleur has to take some plan shots early and, and mm -hmm. loosen them up that way. Think in reverse. You can't always think established to run first. Are you expecting a lot more Garrett Wilson? It seems like one of the takeaways immediately after the game and from what Robert Sala said on Monday is that we're going to be seeing a lot more Garrett Wilson on this uh, offense going forward. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more Garrett Wilson. You're going to see a lot more Barrios jet motion and a lot more 11 personnel. The 13 personnel didn't work. They had Cager in a starring role early, slipping, interception. You know, the throw was probably inaccurate anyway, but regardless, back-to-back -back terrible plays with the uh, back, the block in the back. I like the aggressiveness, but block in the back or hold or whatever it was, and then the slip. Um, I expect a lot more Garrett Wilson. He could be he could be a star in this NFL, and he reminds me of San Antonio Holmes so much. I keep saying it. I don't know why. He just – his movement how fluid he is. He just reminds me of that guy. Certainly one of the few positives on offense was E. Garrett Wilson's performance on Sunday. Let's talk about the defense, Robbie. I mean, you alluded to it. The Jets defense, I thought, played really well. Like They mm -hmm. gave them a legitimate chance to be in this game on Sunday. It was 10-3 at the half. They got the stop coming out of halftime, and just the Jets offense did absolutely nothing to give the defense a shot. As far as what you saw, from this defense because you and I had many conversations over the summer about Jeff Ulbricht's scheme and Robert Sala, what the plan would be. What did you think of what they did in week one? And do you think what they did in week one is sustainable going into Cleveland in week two? I do. And the two big questions I alluded to earlier, stop the run. And the other thing is the game plan, the X's and O's. I was pleasantly surprised at the X's and O's against Lamar Jackson. They, they stifled them. Other than some boneheaded plays in the in the secondary joiner on that deep one after they couldn't recover the fumble. Other than that, it was a great game plan. You know, flood the middle of the field. You know Lamar Jackson's arm doesn't really reach the sideline in intermediate fashion, like 15 yards. He doesn't make that. He can't make every throw on the field. He is deadly accurate when there's, when there's air underneath the ball. Kind of like, you know, he's kind of like Strebler in a lot of ways, but deadly accurate when there's air under the ball. So middle of the field, deep downfield, and he burned the Jets deep downfield, but they did the right thing. They said, we're going to take away the run. We're going to make you beat us over the top. And those two plays, the, what was it, Bateman or Duvernay with the joiner one, the deep, paw, deep post? I think it was Bateman, correct? Bateman or Duvernay. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, and so that one, and then the Bryce Hall play on third and, what was it, third and six in the corner it was good coverage but unfortunately you got to think situationally it was a cover one or cover one robber where they're taking away the middle of the field so if you're a corner and you're on an island and you're going to press you cannot get beat over the top you got to keep everything in front there so it's just little things and sala you know for all the frustration the fan frustration and i get it he was right in the post game in that they didn't get beat. They lost the game. It was boneheaded decisions. Um, and he even alluded to Garrett Wilson, that great play he made on his first touch where he made like 78 guys miss but had a chance to get the first down and didn't lunge forward. Hey, I know fans don't want to hear that, but it is a coaching point, and Garrett Wilson himself will be like, yeah, I got to get the first down there. Great play, but I got to get the first down. That's what coaching is. You got to analyze everything. So you got to eliminate the boneheaded plays, the – positive is there it wasn't sloppy there weren't false starts there weren't dead ball penalties like we saw last year so that's a positive you know you look at the Jets defense Robbie it's why I'm so frustrated you know they didn't have a chance to win in the fourth quarter I mean they had the number one graded defensive back in Quinn Williams mm -hmm. the number one graded corner in DJ Reed and if you combine sauce and DJ Reed on the outside they allowed only eight yards Tremendous. and they still lost the game it's just it's hard to fathom Tremendous because you can't give up a 50 yard touchdown like that. If you're joiner, um, you know, it's just an over route or a post route, what have you. And, and joiner's got to be on that guy. It, it eventually drifted into DJ Reed's outer third, but joiner, you're a veteran playing the quarterback of the D of the defensive backs. You can't let that happen. Bryce Hall, you could, you could understand it because I think they wanted to be aggressive there in one-on-one -on -one coverage, took a perfect pass. 
But you take away those two plays, what is there? There isn't much. So the defense looked great. Solomon Thomas, by the way, I think is the most important player of this defense because him in the middle, he's not big, but he plays big. And they ask him to play big. And he was great on Sunday. So Sauce, by the way, stud. He's a star. You could see it right away. He's going to be a star. And quarterbacks will not be picking on him early, as I've heard analysts say, just because he's a rookie. It's not going to happen. You know, you look at what they did against the Ravens as far as stopping the run. You know, Lamar Jackson, only 17 rushing yards. I think the Ravens as a team only had 63. You know, that has to carry over if they want a chance on Sunday against Cleveland because you know you're going to get a lot of Kareem Hunt, a lot of Nick Chubb. Uh, Jacoby Brissett should not be able to beat you. If on the Jets, I'm stacking the box and yeah. I'm saying, oh, yeah, well, we got DJ Reed, we got Sauce Gardner. You're not going to be able to beat us on the outside. We're loading up the box, and we're going to sell out and try and stop the run. Am I nuts for that game plan, or do you think no. the Jets could do something similar? No. The the good thing about the defense for the first two weeks, if there's a good thing about the schedule, it's that. That you're playing offenses that are very similar. So you're going to have a second crack at it with the, with the same concepts in the game plan. Where you're going to stack the box, you're going to ask your DBs to do, do its job, and it's a very good thing because the worst thing in a schedule in game plan is going back and forth and having to adjust. This is very similar. So, you know, it'll be very disappointing if the Jets lose this game. I, I got to be honest. They have to come out with a victory this week and the defense will have to be really good. 100% with you there. We'll open it up to your comments and questions for Robbie. So submit those in the chat box. Super chats will cut the line. Robbie, I want your take on the Robert Sala comment that he made on Monday that he's taking receipts on those that are mocking mm -hmm. the Jets. What, what did you make of those comments? It seems like the fan base is, is very split on it. Half the fan base is like, well, you know what? How dare you say anything? We've been bad forever. Uh, receipts, we have every right to ridicule you. You guys have been bad. And then some people are like, well, he's not talking about the fans. He's talking about the media, and he's just trying to back his team. So the fan base seems very split on this. I'm somewhere in the middle. I see both sides. Where are you at with the comments from Robert Sala? Overall, you know, if I put myself in coaching shoes, which I am a coach in high school, I I love it. It's I love it with a caveat. I understand frustration from the fan point of view. And here's the thing. Sala does too. Sala knows by saying those quotes that he puts the pressure on himself. And he said it in the past. He doesn't mind putting the pressure on himself. He doesn't mind taking the heat, you know, putting it on his shoulders. And I think he did that purposefully because that's a message to his team. If there's a big job to do and you want to turn around a franchise, you got to have faith and you got to have a leader who believes it, not that it can happen, but it will happen. And I think that's the message that he's trying to get across. And if you're the fans, yeah, put heat on them. They deserve it. He deserves it. And the heat should continue until the results come. And even Sala knows this. But, you know, moving past all the smoke, uh, I love the message. I, I like it. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things where it's like he's putting the onus on him now even more so than previously. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, if this thing goes out there and only wins four games. He's not here next year anyway. So he, he turns the heat up on him, maybe puts a more of a target on him. But I mean, that target was coming if the teams continued to not win. But you know what could what would really help them with the fan base? No one thinks they're winning on Sunday. Go win. Go Beat win. Beat a Browns team that's not great with Jacoby Brissett at quarterback, man. If the, like, the Giants can win a week one, the Bears can win a week one, the Texans could tie the Colts, Seattle can win a week one. Why can't the Jets go out there and beat a Browns team that's still in flux? It's early in the season. This is when you want to play a team like that. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I think any loss would be a disappointment. You have to win this game. It's and especially after reviewing the film against Baltimore, in a lot of regards, the Jets were the better team. Mm -hmm. It's it is not hyperbole. It's not moral victory. It's it's legitimate. It's the truth. They just did what losing teams do. They made it. They made boneheaded on field decisions. Again, the progress is there that they cut out the the dead ball stuff, the sloppiness that you saw from the coaching staff last year, which really concerned me, and the X's and O's from a defensive perspective that befuddled me. But you can't have those moments where 
you can't do that where you, where you look at it and say, what are you doing here? You know, if you're Joyner or if you're Bryce Hall. Uh, and the other thing is too, emotions of the game, every single moment where the tide could have been turned, like the fumble before that deep play where Joyner, you know, botched it, they easily could have had that fumble. And every one of those moments didn't go the Jets way. And they got to capitalize that, th capitalize that on that this week uh, against Cleveland. No doubt about that. He's Robbie Sabo. My name is Jake Asman. If you have a question for Robbie to answer, he's the co-founder of JetsXFactor.com, hosts the Underdog Podcast with Wayne Corbett. Submit those in the comment box, and we will pull them on the screen. A couple of things I want to address here. The Jet Lounge has a cool event coming up on Sunday at Lobo Loco in Staten Island from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mike Westoff is going to be hanging out with the guys doing a book signing. He'll also autograph any other Jets merchandise that you bring in free of charge. So go buy Mike Westoff's book. Hang out with the Jet Lounge crew at Lobo Loco in Staten Island from 11 a to 4 p.m. No charge to get in. And Mike's going to autograph anything you want for free. So support Mike, support the Jet Lounge, and watch the game on Sunday, Jets and the Browns. Before we get to the Q&A now with Robbie, let's talk sports betting, shall we? BUSR is my official sports book. And if you want to bet on sports, you should do it with BUSR. At BUSR, you'll find live lines, future bets, and really any line on any sport is available at BUSR. Yankees and Red Sox tonight. Maybe you bet on Aaron Judge. They hit two more home runs tonight. Why not? What he's doing is insane. BUSR.com slash Asman. Mets and the Cubs. The Mets going to win a game against Chicago. Bet on the Mets tonight if you so choose. Got Thursday night football coming up in uh, what? I guess a little more than 24 hours now, right? You got a really good game tomorrow night between the Chiefs and the Chargers. Kansas City right now, four-point favorite. So these are just some of the many games you can wager on at BUSR. Scan that QR code, sign up today, and start betting with my official sports book at BUSR.com slash Asman. All right, here we go. Comments, questions, anything on your mind for Robbie Sabo? We'll start with some super chats here. This first one is from Esmon, who says, What's up, guys? Didn't like Flacco at all last Sunday. Quote, I thought he could read defenses. Getting to his checkdowns five seconds later, shake my head. It's a good point by Esmon, Robbie. I heard Flacco even say, hey, I wish I went to my checkdowns quicker in the first half. Do you think there's something to that? And, and what noticeable differences could we see maybe from Flacco on this offense on Sunday? Yeah, no, he, he should have went to checkdowns earlier because Baltimore – like I said, they couldn't stretch the field, the Jets. And Baltimore was making sure nothing deep beat them in the city. Even though they were aggressive in the box, they were lagged in the secondary. And the reason Flacco didn't go to the checkdowns is because he was a rookie quarterback looking at the rush, staring at the rush, worried about the rush getting at him. And I don't care how bad the offensive line is. If you're a quarterback, you can't, you, you can't play to that level. You have to be you have to be tougher in the pocket. And that was the biggest disappointment for me, that Flacco was flustered in so many ways that he was looking at the rush and everything broke down in his head. And that really concerned me. Dr. Z says, many of these guys are playing together for the first time. Don't you think chemistry plays an important role in success? Yes, and especially at, on the offensive line. I mean, George Fant wasn't great, but you know he's moved left tackle, right tackle, left tackle back and forth so many times. So the offensive line is definitely an issue in terms of chemistry, the injuries. Uh, I guess the only positive is there were no major injuries that came from week one, unlike last year, where it felt like the whole team, you know, hit the IR, Becton and, and Mann and Joyner. So yeah, the O-line needs another game together. The Jet Show checks in. Thoughts on Carl Lawson's performance in week one? I thought Lawson was okay. He was solid, good in the run game. Again, the run game, everyone was tremendous uh, from the D-line to the linebackers. Quan, Quan and Whitehead do so much in terms of intangibles with their leadership, with their just their energy. So uh, really good stuff. And Lawson, I thought Lawson was solid. The room for improvement, especially in the uh, on the pass rush, but pretty solid. I thought overall the the defensive line did a pretty good job. Like yeah. you know, like they, I just I don't have a a lot of gripes with the defense. I just it, it's it's just so frustrating. They didn't have a chance to win this game in the fourth quarter, given how well 
it looked like they played for most of this game. There were a couple of coverage snafus, of course, but I mean, you're, you're facing Lamar Jackson and you held him to 17 rushing guards and you didn't have a chance to win the game in the fourth quarter. Like that's like unfathomable that they couldn't do that. And on top of it, the Jets ran the ball well early. They well, what did they average? Five or six yards a pop in the first yep. half. And they just you, got down so much, you got to throw every play. How do you not score points in the first half when you're running the ball for five or six yards a pop? You got to score points, and it, it comes down to the quarterback. Honestly, it come the quarterback was horrendous. It was not good. <laughs> it was it not was good. Horrendous. Bonesy says very excited for football this week. The heat is on, baby. Salah put a lot of pressure on himself and the team. And I'm hoping it lights a fire under their ass. Playing mad sometimes is a good thing. I, look, I hope that's how the players interpret those comments. They they play for one another. They go out there and they're inspired. But I mean, so much of it will come down to can Flacco give them a chance, right? Like the, the rest of the a lot of the team played well this past Sunday, and they still lost by a lot because the quarterback play was so god awful. Can Flacco give them something, man? Can he can he just be competent? That's all we're asking for. He was bad on Sunday. Yeah, I don't have much faith. I, I got to be honest, I don't. And again, I would go to Mike White. I know I'm a little higher. Listen, he's no Johnny Unitas, but I'm a little higher on Mike White than the average Jets fan. He, They're both not mobile quarterbacks, yet Mike White is Michael Vick compared to Flacco. I mean, he could at least move a little bit. You know, he's not a statue. So... Having that mobility, the the touchdown you threw to Barrios against Cincy last year, you watch it again. It, five man rush, guy comes straight at him. He kind of throws off his back foot in a in a strange platform and anticipates it and just drills Flacco in the perfect or drills Barrios in the perfect spot. Flacco can't do that. Everything has to be perfect for Flacco to operate, and it's not 2008 anymore where this is a different game. So. This one, this one really confuses me. I got to be honest. So I'm not expecting much from Flacco. I think the defense will have to carry him in the run game. Well, absolutely you know, as well. If he's lifeless again, I don't know how you don't make a change at, at halftime or maybe even sooner if it's that bad. I mean, they don't owe Joe Flacco anything. No. Like he didn't win a Super Bowl for the Jets. He won a Super Bowl for the Ravens a decade ago. Uh, the Jets don't owe him anything here. He's the backup quarterback until Zach's here. And if the offense is not playing well. Mike White won a game last year. Joe Flacco's never won a game as a Jet quarterback. Not one game has Joe Flacco started and won. And he played in 2020. He played a game last year. Played already one game this year. Like, the loyalty they have for Flacco, it's almost as if he won a Super Bowl with the Jets. He didn't. <laughs> yeah. It's it's mind-boggling, honestly. And the vibe, the feel, you know, he's winless as a starter, goes a long way as well. So I don't get it. For everything I liked on Sunday, the defensive X's and O's, um, you know, I just don't understand this decision. I really don't. Robbie, uh, Joe wants to know, what would it take to bench Flacco mid-game? Could they make a change if Flacco's taking care of the ball but not getting much in the first half? It, uh, it just comes down to game situation, I guess. And if the O-line is – see, the worst thing that happened in terms of this decision is the O-line not doing a good job when standing up, when pass protecting. Because like everyone could point to that and say, well, listen, if we if we clean that up, Flacco will have a chance, and he'll do what we know we could do. But again, the problem is Flacco has never been a, a a true quarterback who moves through progressions at an elite level. He's more of a sightline thrower, where he, you know, it's almost pre-planned, and he, his arm is still tremendous. There's no question about it. But y you got to. In today's NFL, you have to improvise. And that doesn't mean necessarily running. You just have to improv improvise and manipulate coverages in a way where I don't know if he could do that anymore. Did the Jets win this past Sunday if Zach Wilson's the quarterback? Because I don't think it's crazy to think they had a legitimate chance to if he was there. Yeah, I think they do. Man, it's it's crazy, right? It's just if they just had average quarterback play, that's a game in the fourth quarter with a chance to win. Yeah, and I think they do. And listen, it was, what was it? 10-3 at halftime? Yep. And Three of those get, points were gifted by the Flacco uh, pick. Yeah, and the punts, again, the punts too, the 20-yard punt. It, those are the boneheaded on-field decisions that you just can't make. And the Ravens, the difference is the Ravens didn't make those moves. The Jets did. The other thing that was classic Jets was they failed to pick up the fumble then the next play is the touchdown. That's it. That's one of the many uh, emotion-swinging possibilities that the Jets didn't capitalize on. Yep. 
no doubt about that. If you have a question for Robbie, write it in the chat box. Super Chats will cut the line. We'll continue here with some Q&A before we wrap up with the founder of JetsXFactor.com, Robbie Sabo. Dez has got a Super Chat. He's up next. He says, why is this team so bad playing zone defense? We have DBs and pass rush. Send the blitz. I think uh, there's – well, they're new, number one, so they're still feeling each other out. And zone – it's much more noticeable in zone because guys are more wide open where completion happens and guys aren't around, you know, there's not a close defender. So I think it's much more noticeable, but with this D I think Des is right where man coverage they're they're actually a little better man coverage because of sauce Gardner sauce Gardner. That's such a weapon where you could take away one guy and I don't think there's a, any such thing as a shutdown corner in today's league, but he's the closest thing to it or will be the closest thing to it. Not exactly yet. Um, they'll be okay in terms of zone, man. They're still working it out. Franco says, Ty Law signed to the practice squad. Thank God Braden Mann is on his way out. What do you think of that? I mean, Braden Mann, to me, he, he's just been awful, and you can't just keep him because he was a drive pick. Who cares at this point? He, he, he contributed in a major way to why you lost a game on Sunday. Your punter's doing that. What's the point? I thought he said Ty Law at first. I'm like, oh, geez. I'm <laughs> bringing back uh, an old school corner. Um, Yeah, you can't you can't stick with it. And Douglas's first draft, it's looking like a complete dud. Mm -hmm. But, you know, don't think that that's the only thing that matters in terms of front office and personnel. It, it's not because even the best GMs, Ozzy Newsom, had terrible drafts. And it was Douglas's first draft during COVID where you can't vet players to the best of your ability. You can't get to know them. So it's not an excuse. It's just reality. But you got to open it up. And man is included. And it's time. It's about time. And, you know, I guess the frustration as well is, you know, Greg Zerline also yeah. was horrendous. I mean, Rodrigo Blackenship is out there, Robbie. I know he wasn't good week one with Indy, but. Would you, would you take a chance on him over Zerline, or do you think they're going to stick with Zerline? I don't know. It's it's a good question. Uh, if I had to bet, I'd say they're sticking with Zerline. But, uh, again, open it up. Try to get the best guy because you cannot – loyalty has no room here to, to exist, and that's the most important thing. Matthew wants to know, how did you think Max Mitchell did overall when you watched the film? He was solid. Mitchell was solid, and that was a big concern coming in, the Dwayne Brown injury. It's – that was a killer, an absolute killer. Um, all things considered, I think they still did a decent job in August. But again, on the other side of it, rust is to be expected because this is the way the, of the NFL these days. August is just evaluation, and hey, that's the way it is. So uh, Max Mitchell was solid. It, it was the left side that really was pretty poor, and that was Fanton Tomlinson. So uh, get that buttoned up. They should be okay. Albert says, why does Salah address critics? It was the same with Rex last year. Just focus on coaching the team. I mean, I'll say this. Robert Sala was asked about Rex Ryan's comments about him in an interview, and he said, he knows where you can find me, and then Rex apologized to him. So I think it's very misleading to say, oh, well, Robert Sala got into it with Rex. Re Rex spoke with him and then came out of that apologizing and then singing his praises. So I'm not going to blame Sala for that. Look, I, I understand Albert's first part of the question, though, right? Why address anything? He puts a target on himself, but the reality is that target would be there if this team went out there and only won four games this year, and he probably would be out of a job. So, all right, show us something. If he thinks maybe that could motivate his team and that by saying, hey, I believe in you guys, we're going to turn this around, watch this, then I'm all for it. But now you got to go out there and you got to win on Sunday. We're, we're tired of, well, you know, we did some nice things against the Ravens, and we're building something special here. Win games. That's how you're judged. Yeah, and – if Sala was Mangini, where he didn't say anything, if they're not winning, it doesn't matter. You know, so if the results aren't there, it does not matter. And if he was Mangini and he was bland and vanilla, fans would have, you know, the same noise, just in a different light. So Sala, he's not a stupid dude. He, you know, he may not be an X's and O's guru, but his motivation and emotions and interpersonal relationships is how he works. And in a lot of ways, when you're, when you're building a football program, that's what you want. And he would not have said what he said in terms of receipts. If he didn't feel comfortable about the film and, and how they played. 
and how they've improved. And I saw it too. And it was really there. The talent is in the building. So, you know, he's not foolish enough to say that without realizing that he has something here that the next step is results. And that that's the key one. That's the tough one. Will that come? I don't know. I don't even know if Salah knows, but he's going to believe it will. And, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's the right move. Just win games, man. That's yeah. that's what it comes down to. This team can't start 0-9, and, and, you know, they can't win only three or four games this year or even five wins. It's like it feels like an underwhelming season. And I the was- schedule is brutal, too. I mean, that's the other part. Like, if you look at the schedule, the first eight, nine games, it really is not easy. My, my goodness, this seems to happen to the Jets every year. You just got to find a way. You know, yeah. find a way, win a couple of games, and, you know, like pull, pull off an upset. Upsets are allowed to happen. The Jets last year – they beat Tennessee. They did beat Cincinnati. They should have beat Tampa. Like you just gotta find a way, man. No one wants to hear about oh, well, we're, we're gonna win championships here, and we have such a great process. And Woody and Chris give us everything. It's just that's why the fan base is pissed. It's not all on Sally. He's been here a year, but people just they're tired of it. They spend a lot of money to follow and support and watch this team. And I get it. There's just a lot of frustrations in this fan base right now. Yeah, I get it completely too. And you know, in contrast to what I just said. Even though the schedule is tough, there are winnable games. Every week's a winnable game. You just got to you gotta eliminate the losing mentality. And that's I think that's what his number one focus is. Uh, Dez says, Jermaine looked a step quicker than he did in the preseason. Your thoughts when you watch back the film on Jermaine Johnson, who obviously had half a sack, mm-hmm. beat Morgan Moses off the line uh, on Lamar Jackson in week one. Yeah, Jermaine looked okay, and as a whole, to your point, Jake, the D-line was tremendous. You know, I didn't even see Shepard do many terrible things like we've seen in the past, and a lot of that was a, was a run-first defensive game plan, but, hey, to their credit, they looked fresh, they looked good. Uh, the rookies looked solid, Jermaine and Clemens. So, you know, off and away we go to to Cleveland. Just keep that pressure on Brissett and uh, see what happens. No doubt about it. Robbie, tell everyone as we wrap up here where they could find you. I know you got a new podcast with Wayne Corbett coming out later today. So tell everyone all about Jets X Factor and where they can listen to the podcast with Wayne. Yeah, Underdog Jets podcast coming out in the next hour on YouTube and on the site. Uh, Corbett gets into Flacco, the quarterback decision. Some interesting thoughts there, actually. Um, So check it out to... uh, you know, see what Wayne said, the former Garfield High School point guard himself. And uh, go to JetsXFactor.com, all the film breakdowns. I think Vitor had a Flacco film breakdown where you could see really where things uh, things broke down. And, and it was it was not good because you can't look at the rush like Flacco did. And I think that'll be the main thing in Cleveland, pass protection, Flacco. But yeah, JetsXFactor.com, all the good stuff. There you go. He's Robbie Sabo. My name is Jake Asman. Appreciate all of you for taking the time to watch today's show. Please hit the subscribe button on the right-hand side of your screen if you're new. Like the video on your way out. That's how this channel continues to grow. Thanks to everyone who took time to watch. We'll have more videos throughout the week as we're another day closer to the Jets and the Browns. Sunday at the Dog Pound where the midfield logo, Robbie, will be Brownie the Elf. Will uh, it really? Cleveland. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that yesterday, but uh, hopefully the Jets could make the Browns winless with Brownie the Elf on the field. One of the all-time classic logos. That one, the old Denver one, the end, of course, Pat the Patriot. And, you know, as much as we all hate the Patriots, that logo is tremendous. Oh, yeah. There, so there you go. He's Robbie. I'm Jake. Appreciate all of you for watching. Hope everyone has a wonderful Wednesday, and we'll talk to you guys soon.